Good morning, David. Hello. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, David. How are you? Oh, hello. How are you? Nice to see you. Good morning, nice to see you. Dr. Well. Good morning, Mrs. Busaina. How are you? Nice to see you. Good morning, Dr. Amal. Good morning, David. Hello. Hello. Nice to see you both. <laughs> so, Thanks for accepting going? my invitation. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Looking forward to it. So, how's it been going? I am. Um, how's the sessions been running? Good. The session will be running uh, very good. Uh, nice. The conference as well is very good. You had to attend. It uh, okay. included the very nice sessions about science diplomacy, uh, about uh, scientific issues around the world, about refugees, UN. Too much, too much sessions, really. Excellent. And rich, yeah. Mater yeah. rich material for publications about uh, science and refugees and the interface between policy and science. Right. Interesting. Yeah. I will share you, with um, you the link. You record for, for videos. Yes, I will share with you the links for. Okay, recording. great. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Me and yeah. you will be moderators, so that you choose if you will moderate the discussions and the questions, or I moderate the discussions and the questions. It will well, yeah. uh, the, um, divide. Yeah. Mm, it will divide into two parts. The first part yeah. talks, and then science um, discussions. So that yes. may um, I uh, introduce uh, speakers as example, and you will moderate the discussions. What do you think? I can do that. OK, yeah. thanks. Hello, Mrs. Rasha. Hello, oh. Mr. Muhammad. Hello. Yeah, yeah. hello. I think we have uh, the similar time zone here in Egypt now, 11. Uh, yes. No, no, it's, yeah, it's 11, but in, in Iraq, in, I think it's 12. 12, and UK, UK, yeah, it's uh, nine? Yes, two, uh, two hours. Um, Almost nine. Yeah. Almost nine. Yeah, nine o'clock. Yeah, okay. it's yeah. been here in Belgium, so I think Belgium we have time zone. Two? <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> different time zone. Very international. <laughs> very international. You know that the first day we have a very international session in the beginning because one of the speaker was uh, in Hawaii. So that 12 hours uh, before. So that we wow. were in the morning wow. and she was uh, at the midnight. And oh. the two others from Japan. Hmm. Six hours ahead, oh. <laughs> and one <laughs> from <laughs> Europe, two hours <laughs> forward, <laughs> and me here, and one from Iraq. <laughs> it's difficult to arrange something well, like this. Yes, it's difficult. And also afternoon session, two from uh, US, one from Canada. So that different. One in the beginning of the day, and we, uh, we are sleepy. <laughs> 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 too much but it's the privilege of uh, online i think it's yes. advantage yes to collect yes. Uh, more speakers from different time zones right in the normal case they would refuse to travel but in this case online they accept to uh, to give for uh, speech or something like that from different time zones i think it's yeah, exactly. the cost i think the cost also now is it's much easier, it's much much cheaper actually to have something online than have it um, in person. Yeah. It's, it's, mm. also. it's cheaper, yes. But it's disadvantage for the civilization and the people themselves. No interaction, only sitting in front of computers. Yes. And no gain the experiences for the new generations. Mm. <laughs> no interaction. I think people are. Um, if it feels less intimidating to have an online conference, if you you know if you want to ask a question, I feel that um, you know it's it it feels easier somehow um, rather than putting your hand up in a big conference room. 
Um, really? <laughs> I, I, I feel so, yeah, personally. Yeah. Maybe you feel so because you are experienced it, but for, uh, but for the new generations and students, I think interaction uh, give them some experience in mm. how to face the audience or uh, how to interact with people, how to gain some experiences. But in front of computers, they may read everything from uh, their mobile. Yes, yes. <laughs> you understand? They may face you in the computer and taking mobile in their hands. Yes. Uh, no experience, no uh, direct interactions. Yes. So that it, it's disadvantage for the youth. Maybe less, less networking. Oh, less networking. Yeah, I think on, on um, yeah, less networking, less side talks. Um, and I think this is very important, particularly for, for um, journalists. Actually, our work come out from side talks. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yes. You know that one principle from science diplomacy that all good agreements or important agreements may take place at the, at the toilets. You understand? <laughs> it's the first lesson we took uh, in Italy that uh, good agreements and big agreements to, uh, took place in toilets. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> Not uh, over uh, lunches or something like that in toilets. <laughs> <laughs> During washing hands, uh, arranging makeup or something like that. All arrangements. <laughs> yeah. Right. So that it's very uh, lesson in diplomats. Yeah, yeah. We spoke to um, we spoke to somebody recently who organised a conference and made the assumption that everybody in the conference was in a wheelchair. So there was no there was no um, networking at the lunch queue. Everybody had their lunch brought to them, and and she did it because she wanted it to be an you know an equal playing field, so that you know there weren't these little clusters of people um, that can feel exclusive. It was very it was very interesting talking to her. Um, and I don't know if she's repeated it, but um, but you're right. I mean, a lot of the um, you know the, the decisions get taken in the toilets or at the coffee queue or whatever. Yeah, it's not formal. <laughs> Uh, the speaker uh, this day in Italy uh, gave us this uh, lecture, but uh, this say informal. Yes. You understand? He said yes, uh, informal, that you know that uh, several agreements made up uh, in yes. toilets because of washing hands, you shutting together, uh, something like that, so that you can make some agreements away or outside of the formal arrangements or something like that. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Amal, may I ask what will be the order of the speakers? The order like uh, the program. Okay. okay. So that uh, Mrs. Nerina at first, uh, Dr. David, uh, Mrs. Rasha, Mrs. Vusaina, and you. Okay, perfect. Okay. I think Nerina not there. Can you see me, oh, Amal? Yes, hello, Narina. How are you? Hi, I'm fine. Hi. How are you? Fine, thank you. So great. Thanks to... a lot for joining us. Uh, it's a pleasure. Thank you so much for inviting me. And nice to meet you all. <laughs> Thanks a lot. We have still uh, seven you. minutes. We have still seven minutes. Okay. Can I try just to share screen to make sure that everything... Okay, share good. screen. Just okay. make try it. Okay. Yes. I we see, can see everything. It. It's can you see it in full screen? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Okay. It's working. By the way, uh, this session uh, is on Facebook mm. of science uh, of women in live, science without borders. Live stream. Yes. Um. Uh, Dr. Shaheen, uh, can you please share uh, the link? Um, uh, Amal, uh, can I also try to share my screen? If yes, it works? Okay. we have still uh, six minutes or seven minutes. Yes, but uh, because I will try to, if I don't leave like this, uh, then you have this, uh, sorry, one second. If, it, if you see it there or not. Uh, yes, yes, I see the see screen. It. Okay. Okay. But lots of stars. Always, Amal, you know me. 
<laughs> always looking for the stars. <laughs> I, I, I saw again, Amal, recently the picture that we took uh, last year at the uh, Brazil. Brazil future of tomorrow with a lot of, you know, the animations. Yeah. <laughs> it was very nice, really. It was the last it's visit. Now, it's really, now life. It was the last Take visit. care. Yes. We are now life. Yeah. You must be exhausted after organizing the conference, um, Amal. Do you, I'm do just you, sitting. You have a, I'm <laughs> just sitting. <laughs> I know, but it's very stressful to organize a big event. Um, but I'm just sitting in front yeah. of my computer. I prefer to travel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Me and yeah. Narina uh, were uh, in last uh, year a conference in Brazil. It was fantastic, really. We visited the Museum mm. of Tomorrow <laughs> and it was the last visit outside yes. Egypt. Oh, yeah. I think yes. it wasn't tomorrow, <laughs> it was yesterday. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We had no idea, Mal, at that point that it would be our last trip. Huh? <laughs> yeah, okay. You can feel free to close the, the cameras and uh, voice for five minutes if you want. Okay.
Good morning. Hello. Welcome you all in our plenary session B5 at the World Forum for Women in Science. The session will be about science communication where I will have a diverse group gathering journalists and science communicators. Each speaker will have 15 minutes to give his or her talk after short introduction from myself Questions and discussions will be at the end and will be moderated by Dr. David Bain. Okay. At first, I will begin with the first speaker, uh, Mrs. Nerina Finito from Sweden. Her talk will be about the power of narrative policies, politics, and pandemics. Um, Mrs. Nerina Finito is the founder and director of Traces and Dreams a platform that brings knowledge and wisdom out of academia, beyond borders, disciplines, and tribes, and fosters interdisciplinarity, narrative, and future literacy through workshops and educational projects. She has worked for newspapers and television, made documentaries and programs about innovation and technology, for German broadcasts, created corporate videos for small and big companies for the internal and external communication, and worked as a ship producer for one of the biggest business television projects. Nerina Finito collaborates with different research institutions and organizations, such as Global Young Academy, Brazilian Academy of Sciences and Women in Science Without Borders. The floor is yours, Nerina, for 15 minutes. Thank you so much, Amal, and uh, please feel free to stop me if uh, I'm too long, so perhaps one minute before the time is over. Okay. I will share my screen now, and I hope that you can see it. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me. Um, it's, it, it is, a, uh, of course, a short presentation about uh, narratives and um, uh, about the challenges that we went through um, in this, uh, um, if you want, special time. Uh, in February 2020, uh, the Director General of the World Health Organization uh, said that health security is not just the health sector's business, it is everybody's business. Now we know how right he was. And in that occasion, he spoke about the fact that we are not just fighting an epidemic, but we are fighting an infodemic. And uh, fake news spreads faster and more easily than the, this virus, and it's just as dangerous. And so the corona um, disease is the first um, pandemic in history in which technology and social media have been used on massive scale um, to keep people safe, connected, productive, but also to enable uh, the dissemination of uh, misinformation, disinformation, and add a huge amount of, of uh, information. And then in the same occasion, um, he said that now more than ever is the time for us to let science and evidence lead policy. And this, is, this was um, the beginning of of course, of a, a, a collaboration of uh, communication, also the underlying importance of communication of science and, and policy working together. And it is not new. Uh, we are in, in, a, in, a, in a new situation, not only because of pandemic, there have been pandemics, of course, before, but it was new, it's the possibility to connect globally and in a, and in a situation where um, of high uncertainty, of course, a situation where everybody felt uh, personally um, involved in this, but where also the economics and the political aspect um, are involved. And there was a huge production of, of content. And of course, the rule of uh, uh, risk communication is normally to be first to be right and to be um, credible. But in this situation was, of course, pretty difficult to be 
first and to be right because we we didn't have uh, the ex exact data we didn't uh, know exactly what kind of policy were the best one and the world health organization for example uh, started collaborating with uh, um, um, social media platform and trying to bring the people to the um, the, the source to help them to find um, the information uh, and at the same time, they try to um, uh, cope with the misinformation that were out there. For example, uh, the one that uh, telling people that drinking methanol could uh, help them to cope with COVID that brought uh, a lot of deaths, for example, in Iran. But if it is easy to communicate something like this, uh, um, it is not easy to communicate all the different aspects involved in this um, uh, kind of situation. And it was also a huge opportunity in the, in the um, of course, in the crisis, but it was a huge opportunity also for scientists to start experimenting and uh, presenting the, the, the research and their opinion in a different way. Uh, for example, on TikTok, there were many people, many researchers collaborating and presenting what they were doing, uh, researching on vaccine, or or a people, a group of uh, medical students uh, presenting, uh, for example, infographics, or in, in Japan uh, using manga to present info information. And the, 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 there was on one end a huge amount of information, on the other end a huge possibility to um, uh, enter this uh, public sphere, the only sphere that we had to communicate more uh, uh, because of the, the, the lack of possibility to meet. And this is, for example, we were just saying this uh, um, um, conference is online as so there's a huge amount of uh, content product also uh, from, from by academia that is now online but it is also used for example the last uh, um, uh, uh, sh sh screenshot is about uh, Venezuela where they for example um, the scientists were not allowed to communicate about science and the government used for example Twitter to speak about the bioterrorists as the people having COVID and wanted to uh, uh, aggress the, uh, attack the, the country. And there is evidence, of course, uh, uh, already in research that how the people behaved on Twitter and what kind of, for example, on Twitter, uh, what they shared uh, really um, uh, influenced their beliefs and uh, as a consequence, uh, their behavior. Because in this crisis, one of the particular was that we needed also to collaborate in, and follow some direction that a lot to do with our behavior. And when we, we look what the people were looking there, it, it was, of course, the, the people, for example, follow, following um, uh, conspiracies, they, they really believe that they, they were doing what they are supposed to do, uh, like find out the best, find the best stories, the best reality, the best data. And they, when they found a source that they felt that it was trustworthy, they, they uh, stick to this. And, um, that's, and once you start believing a story, it's uh, really complicated to go out of it because as, as we know, our, our brains work that we like the same information that uh, uh, confirm our bias, if you want, and because of the uh, algorithm uh, of the uh, social media. And the lack of uh, an, a preserve trustworthy sources uh, is, of course, uh, um, one of the most uh, principal reasons for people to start looking uh, for, for other uh, information. There is, a, as a, um, a, the, of course, I, I see from a European perspective, there have been a, a, a studies here in Europe about how the people make sense of uh, science. And uh, uh, it was astonishing to see that uh, it was less uh, based on uh, scientific information or insight, but more on um, their world, world view, emotions, and cultural uh, beliefs. And besides the fact that uh, there was this a huge amount of, uh, of information and misinformation and information in general, it was also the, the collaboration between uh, scientists on one end and politicians on the other end, that of course it was not new, but it was new in this form because the, the researchers were of course asked to um, um, help to bring data, data that, that were generated in the ways. And so there have been a, a huge um, request of um, um, scientific expertise and it was um, the um, um, 
always said uh, following the science, but the narratives that politicians um, were bringing on the um, stage from um, our past and the reality that we see have played, of course, a huge role. For example, if we think that about the difference between what uh, happened in, in uh, Brazil, where um, the, the uh, Bolsonaro tried to minimize uh, the, the COVID mention like a little few, or what happened in uh, New Zealand, where uh, uh, it was an uh, evidence-based science uh, within a narrative of inclusion and uh, um, where we, we, they spoke about a team of five million trying to crush the curve, uh, go hard and go fast. And uh, the, the, if you think how, for example, um, uh, Trump uh, sp spoke about we have all under control or it is only one person coming from China, it's, it determines really how people perceive um, uh, the situation. And uh, here is Sweden, uh, where I'm based, where um, um, the, the, the Sweden followed a, a little bit another kind of uh, approach. And it was also the, the, the question that um, many people um, from abroad are asking themselves as well living in Sweden, but foreign people who were following a, a other kind of media that were asking, how is it possible that New Zealand is following the science in the same way as uh, Sweden is following the science, but having two completely different uh, approach. The same way uh, that uh, um, Sweden did it pretty well in um, taking care of the narrative. They are really expert in this. They take care of um, how they approach people, uh, uh, speaking with uh, one voice, doing all the, following the rules, if you want, of crisis communications, and uh, uh, um, not letting people uh, become uh, uncertain about the reality. For example, 98% uh, of the people in Sweden follow or take the information from the official sites. And so there are um, no, almost no, uh, conspiracy theory uh, in Sweden. The same uh, from another perspective in um, uh, Thailand, where they um, come from another kind of experience, uh, uh, but uh, uh, organize an integrated agency, speaking with one voice, verified information with multi-sectoral collabora collaboration, taking care of the narrative, and uh, um, much more important than in Sweden because of the situation, pay attention to media literacy and really starting um, educating uh, people about this. And the, 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 the collaboration between uh, politicians and scientists, of course, it was, um, as I said, complicated because it was not only about following the data, but really often it was um, um, it somehow uh, the delay dilemma or the trade-offs that were uh, made because not only because of the uh, um, science based on the, the health situation, but also, of course, of all other st stakeholders and um, the, the other um, uh, data that needed to be to be taken into account. And uh, this is a uh, um, um, journalist working in the USA who said um, that, that we, we were um, not good in explaining the people that we were balancing risk. And, uh, the, and what she pointed out is, for example, that um, uh, the, the academic, uh, our academic communicate is a little bit different and as our um, public perceive um, uh, a message. And she, she, I think this is uh, an example that explained pretty well um, um, what she, uh, she mean. When uh, they say, uh, when the uh, World Health Organization started saying, currently no evidence that people who have recovered from COVID-19 and have antibodies are protected from a second infection. And she suggested that perhaps we should have said, um, we expect the immune system to function against the virus and to provide same immunity from for some period of time. Also, we ask the, 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 the expert, but the, the researchers um, are normally used to uh, publish a, um, a paper when they have the complete data. But in that situation, they were asked to um, give an opinion um, on data that they didn't uh, have yet, but based on their experience. And uh, another point that she made is that 
uh, we we um, we need really to address um, a different community in this um, different way. And in, in many countries, also um, in Sweden, um, it, the, the, to address, for example, uh, um, um, refugees and immigrants was uh, forgotten. And uh, this uh, this um, um, there was also critic, for example, that the message from the World Health, World, World Health Organization were, were more, mostly thought for people working from home or the, with the possibility of working from, from home, what it is really not uh, the uh, most part of the uh, world population. Of course. And if uh, we, uh, we think about uh, what is happening on social health, we tend to say we need the science, we need the data, we, bring, we need to bring out the real facts. But we, we, we need also to understand uh, really uh, based on the evidence that we have from the research that it is do not as of these logos, if this is the data, only with this data, we are not going to reach the people. We need the ethos, this means that the trust in the uh, person or the institution bringing out the message. And we need to consider the audience. We need to understand where they are, what are their fears, what are their, their, their beliefs, what, how can we reach them and, and um, 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 support them in changing um, the mind if it is necessary. And, and uh, the director of OECD, OECD asks, uh, what can we do against the people who believe um, uh, to misinformation or um, that do not believe that uh, COVID exists, for example. We say that we need to acknowledge different life experiences and needs, and we need to start a collaborative process. And I, 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 we, I would invite um, everybody to, to remember that you can only change a story with a new one. So we, we are not going to fight um, conspiracy theories with facts. We need them, but they are not enough. And what, what have we learned um, in these um, complicated months um, um, about uh, how we could uh, need to improve uh, the science communicate not every researcher needs to communicate of course but um, every res researcher needs to be trained and to be aware of the power of um, uh, communication and that, that that the research is not ended with the publication of, of it and in this um, um, it is not regarding um, science communication but it, the, the necessity of literacy science literacy and media literacy uh, also in the public uh, is really key uh, to improve the general situation. Then the co-creation dialogue oriented communication. Also that, that we co-create knowledge and we co-create communication and it is not uh, uh, a source uh, sharing the knowledge but it is really uh, starting a dialogue. Um, it is social media is all, all about uh, dialogue. Then we need to start um, building a, a trust, a long-term trust. It, ha it doesn't happen in one day. This is a process. And in this, that we need a, the strategy. We need to understand what, where and what, uh, who do we have to address and in a long-term perspective. Of course, uh, the holistic approach. And so this is one of the things that came out from this uh, situation is really um, the collaboration of of uh, scientists uh, in different countries, also um, in the Arabic world, uh, happened uh, pretty well, as, as I understood. And uh, an holistic uh, approach on interdisciplinary teams, not only from different um, uh, science, but also from uh, the humanities and from social uh, science. And also for communication, that communication needs to be part of this uh, um, of these uh, teams, and it, it is uh, needs to be more topic driven than challenge um, driven communication. Of what in what what kind of uh, information do I need in this situation? And um, one of the uh, for me one of my main topics always been and now. Um, even more is the research not seen as a product, but as a process. And so that is uh, embracing the uncertainty of our research, but also the journey of uh, research. 
and the courage of the long stories. If we uh, stick to the headline, if we stick to, uh, Marina, to, to one uh, minute. Thank you. If we uh, stick to to the um, to the headline, then we are going only to um, um, to help uh, um, um, to uh, to build uh, more walls and not to build uh, uh, bridges. If you want, we need to have the courage to explain what is before and what is going to uh, go uh, to come after this. And um, and I believe that uh, we need also narratives. Narratives, are of course, about uh, science, but we need also the really the big uh, narrative. And so today, modern nations, but I would say we can say today, world and uh, principally defined by the stories we tell about our collective selves, our victories and defeats, our heroes and foes. This is who we are. And the saying up to to fake it. Uh, says um, we, it is time to imagine a better future, not just because it is drowning near, but because that is how we get through what remains. Um, the um, general director, director general um, said, um, we have already lost so much where we cannot lose hope. We, it is a time for all countries to renew their commitment to universal health coverage and to build a safer, fairer, greener, more inclusive world we all want. And I, 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 I believe that um, science is going to win. And so the, the only way that we have to win is, of course, with science. But science is not going to win alone. We need uh, this, uh, the social science, we need the, the humanity, and we need to start um, telling the narratives about a future that is um, better, safer, equal, and that we do not go to the uh, back to the normal, but uh, where we start imagining, create the new normal. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot, Nerina, for this nice talk. You are right. We are facing infodemic. We need scientific data and building trust, but we, uh, but we will make discussion at the end. Okay, stay with us. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot. The next speaker will be Dr. David Bain uh, from UK. He is a managing director for careers and supplements nature. Uh, Dr. David uh, joined the, the science journal Nature in 2016 in his current role as managing director. He and his team oversee careers and supplementary content, including nature index and nature outlooks he has worked as a journalist and editor for more than 30 years, mostly on health and science titles. Prior to joining Nature, he worked as online editor at the British uh, Medical Journal. The floor is yours or the Zoom is yours, Dr. David, for 15 minutes. Go ahead. Thank you, Dr. Amin, um, and thank you for inviting me to speak today. Um, I wanted to um, to 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 compliment um, you know Narina's ex excellent excellent presentation about science communication by focusing a little bit on how scientists can and should talk to the media to promote what they do. Um, obviously, it's a subject very close to my heart because of uh, my biography that you just talked about. There, I believe passionately in the you know in the good communication of science via the media. Um, a lot of science, just to just to clarify why it's important to. Um, to communicate your science via the media. I'm just using a quote here from a, an article that we published um, in the Nature Career section uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, and this came from somebody at Imperial College who um, I think did a survey of scientists at Imperial College in London and found out that, you know, if, if you do give your story to the media, you can get more citations from your work. You get come to the attention of potential collaborators. You get invited to speak at conferences. Um, you might get approached by industry, investors, philanthropists, and uh, people that might want to participate in your clinical trials. So it's very much a win-win. Um, I want to very briefly talk about what we do in the Nature Careers team. And as you can see, there's a little um, screen grab there of a column that we published in April last year from uh, Professor Amin, who we work very closely with um, on basically promoting the work of um, you know, this particular forum and how that helped to um, support researchers um, around the world. 
so as well as doing columns of the kind that we published we also do news we have features um, we do a podcast we do webcasts we do many q and a's with working scientists and we participate in talks and events like this we also do an annual survey so we um we did a phd survey a couple of years ago which was a global look at how phd students around the world are feeling last year we did postdocs and this year we'll be looking at salary and job satisfaction among scientists around the world and we also will report very extensively on technology in the life sciences but i would say primarily in the career section we're in, we're interested in the people that do the science not so much the science itself that's rest the re that's left to the rest of nature and I want to talk a little bit about that side of um, communicating with the media, about how to get your science talked about, as well as, as, well as obviously your career. Um, I just be Before I move on to that, I just want to give you a quick snapshot, um, and it follows on from the last presentation, about the subjects that people like to hear about in the career section. So um, you know, obviously last year we pivoted much more to reporting on how to survive the pandemic as a working scientist and how to you know, um, work effectively from home, how to juggle all the things that um, you, know, you were having to juggle alongside you know, doing your work, your lab may be closed, you were you know, probably having to homeschool children. And there was a lot of hunger and appetite, I would say, for those kinds of stories. There are also lots of interest in supporting diversity in science. You know, we're particularly interested in underrepresented groups in nature careers. So if you have a story that you want to share with us, I would really strongly urge you to, to get in touch. Funding is another massively important topic that we report extensively. The stories from individual PhD students and postdocs and how they had a particular issue that they resolved. Um, mental well-being, very important, getting published mentoring, how to manage your time more effectively, and also how to navigate a global career move. Science is hugely mobile, or it certainly was until the pandemic. So there's lots of information that people want to have around that. So um, this is just a snapshot of four examples of the things I just talked about, really. Uh, the one in the bottom left, 20 things I wish I'd known when I started my PhD, had hundreds of thousands of um, uh, um, visits when it was first published in 2018 and continue to do, continues to do very, very well. But I'm going to get back to the core of my topic, which is about engaging the media, um, obviously a hugely important topic. Um, I want to just look at a uh, paper that got published in a journal called um, Computers in Human Behaviour, and it was all about uh, smartphone usage. Um, and this obviously started life as a research paper. Um, as often happens when a researcher publishes a paper, they talk to their press office. And this is how the press office um, at that particular institution communicated the science. So um, it used this headline, Reliance on Smartphones Linked to Lazy Thinking, which suggested some uh, causality there, which um, a UK newspaper um, reinterpreted as our smartphones making us stupid googling information is making us mentally lazy study claims so I think the, the you know the the reporting of that story was quite a way away from how the original abstract communicated the science and there is a I suppose a cautionary tale there about how to work with press officers and how to communicate your science and to make sure that you um, are not over hyping that you are being accurate in the way things um, are reported but um, I think it's just worth bearing in mind also that you know newspapers magazines broadcasters are going to be very um, interested in pushing the limits of your science and trying to sometimes make claims about it that may not be completely accurate um, this is another I would say you know kind of at the other end of the spectrum this is an example of a preprint paper that looked at um, you know, the connectome, um, you know, the map of neural brain circuitry um, in relation to fruit flies. So obviously these are, you know, hugely used by um, by biologists um, to, um, you know, to, to, uh, to understand uh, human behavior and human biology. And um, I'm just singling out a couple of headlines here because I think this was an example of, um, you know, a, a happy outcome for the researcher. You know, this was a story that got covered in Wired and MIT Technology Review. Um, so, you know, the most complete brain map ever is here, a fly's connectome. And this map of a fly's brain connectivity is the best we've ever seen. So sort of very positive, very celebratory um, 
very celebratory headlines there. And I think the key to the way that that story got reported is that the, the researcher, when, when they were interviewed, thought very much about the headline that they wanted to see, about how they can translate their science into very, very plain English. Um, and, you know, the quote that really stands out for, for me was this phrase that fruit flies are very skillful. And all that skill, although contained in a brain the size of a poppy seed, involves some neural circuitry similar to our own product of our distant common ancestor so they're rooting it back to our own human experience our home our own human heritage um, that lovely phrase the comparison of the side of the poppy seed you know immediately you're you know you're starting to think about this story in very human terms um, in very kind of uh, vivid um, illustrative terms so I think it was a happy outcome there for this particular researcher I talked earlier a little bit about press officers again this is a quote from a careers feature at nature that uh, said that, you know, if you do have a press office at your institution, you know, they can really help you craft your clear message. They can connect you with journalists and they can increase the visibility of your research. And, um, you know, there are all sorts of career benefits, as I mentioned earlier, that can come from doing that. Um, I, the one the one advice I would give, and, I, and I'm saying this as somebody that has a press officer here at Nature, and obviously uh, work, I work very extensively with university press officers and research institutions, is do please give them, you know, plenty of notification if you've got a publication coming out, you know, if, you're, if you've won a grant or you're conducting a study and you want to get that publicised, the more notice you can give them, the more chance you will get to kind of work together on making sure that you get your messaging absolutely right. Um, I want to very briefly mention a 2014 study that got done in the British Medical Journal, which actually linked, um, you know, if a press release is hyped in any way, um, they looked at hundreds and hundreds of news stories, this research team, and compared it back to the original press release and found that actually, you know, if the press release exaggerated, there was a very strong likelihood that the news story would also exaggerate. So the opposite thing that they found was that if you don't exaggerate, in a press release that actually you know the the the, the story is by and large um, reported more accurately so it's just a sort of a, a cautionary tale there about how you should communicate your science uh, in your press release so i'm looking ahead now to that all important interview and just some advice there about how to understand journalists first and foremost we're generally not scientists and i just want to um, highlight here where Professor, I mean, uh, very um, kindly refers to me as Dr. Payne. I'm not actually a, a doctor. I'm a, a journalist, first and foremost. Um, and, you know, I don't know your field as well as you do. So you really have to hold my hand when you're talking to me about what you do so that I can understand it more easily. Um, we're not stenographers. So although we take copious notes when we interview you, you know, we may not understand everything that you tell us and we might come back back to you and, you and we will not report verbatim everything you tell us we'll put some stuff in indirect speech uh, we will choose selected quotes you know like the poppy seed example I mentioned earlier so if you're speaking to a journalist don't expect it will be wrong of you to expect that you will get reported you know if you give them 20 minutes of your time that all of that 20 minutes will get covered in an article it probably won't do and you need to understand that um, also understand that journalists are independent, so they, they don't actually work for their interviewees. They work for a proprietor and their audience is the most important thing for them. So, you know, they, they will always have the audience in mind when they're writing rather than the people that they spoke to. Um, they will be interviewing other researchers. There'll be lots of perspectives they will have and they need to condense that into a very, very brief interview. Um, they will emphasize different elements. They are, you will always be on the record unless the reporter agrees otherwise, and they won't send you the final article for approval. You know, that is quite unusual and um, it creates all sorts of tensions and problems because obviously they have to do that to everybody. And, you know, you can't write a news story by committee. Um, and that, you know, if you do give an interview, you um, it won't be included. You, you can't guarantee it will be included in a story. These are all very, um, these are very obvious things and I'll move on quickly because I know I'm running out of time. Um, but, you know, you do need to speak slowly and clearly. Um, you do need to have clear take home messages. Um, think about the audience and think about the headline that you want to have as well. You won't be responsible for writing the headline, but it always helps to know what sort of things you want to communicate. And if you have any good graphics, try and include those as well.
Um, again, avoid jargon, avoid hype, try not to be condescending. You know, they won't be probably a scientist, so you need to, um, you know, take it down to a level that they will understand. And also try and inject some personality and color. Um, you know, you will have a great story to tell and make sure that you get it out there. I just want to finish really with, um, I, we, we published this column in May last year, and this was from a very experienced researcher who a few years ago um, had a quite uncomfortable experience when she um, had a paper published in The Lancet and uh, her institution did a press release about it and uh, it was many many years ago and there was less public understanding about attention deficit disorder and um, she went through a very very uncomfortable interview on a on a radio station in the UK um, you know a very popular radio station that goes out every morning nationwide um, and she was opposite somebody who took a very different opinion of attention deficit disorder and the outcome of this was a was a very painful period where you know for the for about a month or so afterwards her lab was inundated with very hostile emails um you know she was she she was you know she was um attacked um it was very very uncomfortable for her um and you know she 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 basically learned a lot from that experience and she shared very kindly those experience with us and the three messages that she really had was that you know she probably should have taken and more care with the press release that she should have cleared her diary because she hadn't anticipated the fallout and um you know when the um when the study was published there was less um, less social media around at the time and she thinks that if the story had been published now she probably would have had you know an even more extreme reaction to it so she needed to think about how the findings were communicated on social media but on a very positive note she did end the um, interview that I did with her saying that you know despite my experience I feel it's important to engage with the media we're doing publicly funded research and we have to communicate our science and she actively encourages all her PhD students and postdocs to do whatever they can to communicate their stories there's lots of resources here that I can share with you but I won't go through them now um, I'll just finish and just basically say thank you for letting me speak today um, I really appreciated it and we'll have questions at the end. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Dr. David. You are very fast, but uh, it was very nice and fantastic lecture. You really, I admire your tips, engaging the media. Uh, engaging the media is one of the key uh, of success uh, to the, the scientists really. And also connect your press officer, really. But sometimes we have no press officer. It's the problem. Yes, I'm, I'm, I am conscious of that. I mean, and I, I and I, and I am, uh, I'm also, I'm, I'm conscious of that. So I am, um, you know, if you have one, you know, do use it. Um, if you don't, I would cultivate, you know, relationships with journalists, you know, you know, you and I okay. connected. Um, it's always very important to, you know, to have those contacts in your network. I would say that. Okay, we will have discussions at the end. Yeah. Okay, we will transfer to the next speaker, uh, Mrs. Russia. Uh, Faik, Mrs. Rasha Faik uh, is uh, editor of El Fanar Media. Rasha Faik is a Syrian journalist who has joined El Fanar Media and online publication covers higher education, research, and culture in the Arab region. Since its launch uh, early in uh, 2013, she has contributed to international publications such as USA Today and the Bloomberg uh, BAN. Russia holds three bachelor's degrees in English literature from Damascus University in dramatic uh, arts from the Higher Institute of Dramatic Arts in Damascus and in journalism, wow, from Damascus Open University. She was a keynote speaker at the Denver University Journalization Summit in 2017. You have a very good CV. I will leave you uh, to tell, about, uh, to tell uh, us about your CV. The floor is yours for 15 minutes. Thank you so much, Dr. Amel, uh, for the invitation and uh, to give me a chance to be with you today. I just would like to ask, first of all, thank David for his very nice presentation. And I would like to ask him to stop uh, sharing his screen because um, so I can also share my screen with you if it's possible. Sorry, yes. Yeah. I forgot to, to tell that uh, Mrs. Rasha uh, lecture will be how journalists can improve the portrayal uh, of, of refugees. 
Uh, thank you, Dr. Aman. Um, uh, today, um, I would, uh, I'm working, as you just mentioned, I'm working with Alfanar Media. Alfanar Media uh, covers higher education and research and culture in the Arab region. Um, very early in 2014, we started to have a special focus on refugees' education. And um, today, I'm going to share with you some of our experience uh, at Alfanar Media on how uh, we cover uh, refugees' um, a crisis in general. And, and because of our focus on education and research, how we also cover this related to refugees. Um, while the story uh, of refugees crisis has often been told through the journey of refugees across borders and their attempts, uh, attempts at resettlement, important perspectives have been missing. Indeed, the refugees' own voices and goals are often left out, especially women. The refugees' quest for education and employment, for example, needs to be explored more. Today, um, let me uh, share my screen with you. Okay. Can you see my screen? Not yet. Not yet. Okay. Okay, now I hope it works. Yeah, it works. Okay. Perfect. So today I'm going to talk from my perspective as a journalist, how we as a journalist can improve the portrayal of refugees. According to the World Migration Report 2018, media in all its forms plays a significant role in the framing of policy discourses that affect how people act, what people think, how policymakers prioritize agendas, and how refugees make decisions. Given this, it raises the question, how should we as a journalists and media professionals approach this complicated and diverse issue? Here are some of, let me say, basic um, tips um, uh, I would like as a journalist to share with my colleagues today. First of all, when we are talking about refugees, we need all the time to remember that our words matter. Unfortunately, sometimes many of us in, in exact terms like illegal and alliance or use, um, um, let me say, um, terms in not a, uh, accurate way. So um, sometimes we say refugees, sometimes we say asylum seekers, uh, displaced without making um, sure what every term means and also uh, the rights and the protection um, the people have under this title. So we need to make sure we choose our words and terms very carefully and um, make sure that we also can consult experts, experts to help us using the correct word. We need also to remember that we need to respect the dignity of refugees. We need to avoid using any kind of dehumanizing language and metaphors that cast refugees as a form of natural disaster, for example. Sometimes out of a lot of sympathy, we, we, we in a way, um, an indirect way, we dehumanizing um, uh, refugees. We want to show sympathy, but while we're showing sympathy, while we talking about their, um, tragic, um, their tragedy, we sometimes, unfortunately, dehumanizing um, them. And we need to be very careful in this. <clears throat> Excuse me. Also, we need to, to, all the time through our reporting to challenge the hate speech. We know how much, unfortunately, some of the uh, stereotype um, reporting have affected badly uh, the refugees crisis. So we need to make sure that we avoid stereotypical negative expressions and look for good successful examples to show. We need to explain the reasons behind the crisis and make sure that all voices are included in our stories. We also, of course, we want to write um, about refugees. We need to talk to refugees. We need to be connected to refugees. It's very important to include their voice. But at the same time, we need to make sure that uh, we have a very honest relationship with them. We don't need um, and we don't have to lie or mislead them by giving them any kind of promises that we can't keep. 
So sometimes we try to, let me say, to convince uh, refugees to talk with us by saying, if you talk to me, if you uh, participate or give me uh, your comments because I'm working on this uh, article or story, this is going to help you, you are going to achieve this and this. So we, we need to be realistic. We need to never lie or mislead them about what we can really offer uh, them. We also need to ensure a balanced coverage. We need to avoid any kind of oversimplifications or even victimization. In, uh, victimization. in most cases, refugees are perceived in extremes, either as a problem or as a victim. We need to challenge this. We need to promote other aspects. For example, usually refugees presented as poor and uneducated people, while most of them could be highly educated. Um, I remember when we started covering um, um, refugees education, uh, it was um, a very, uh, let me say, a big surprise for many uh, of our um, um, uh, readers to know that there are many of uh, refugees well educated, many of them, they are professors, they are researchers, they are scientists, and they are looking for opportunities. Um, in the hosting uh, countries, they all the time have this um, uh, image that the refugee is a, a poor person um, without house, without uh, food, living in camp, um, living living in camps, and uh, just looking for basic um, um, uh, aids uh, to survive. And it was a good, a big shock for many to know that there are many who are looking for opportunities not only to be enrolled at school, but to enroll at universities, to enroll and um, 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 to have um, 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 to work. Um, they they used to be professors um, in their countries. They used to be researchers. They used to be scientists. So all of this, we need to uh, work a bit harder and um, show um, uh, not only uh, let me say the tragedy our um, uh, aspect of the refugee's life, but also to show um, uh, some uh, lights um, uh, um, uh, in their past and, in, and also to help them uh, in their future. We need to show uh, their how they could contribute uh, to the development uh, in the hosting countries. We also need uh, to promote the evidence-based public discourse. We need to make sure that we are using accurate information and resources. We need to be transparent, of course, by this and share with the public resource to further explore the topic at hand. And the most important thing um, for us as, as a journalist to all the time to look for a new approach. The more interesting story would be about the recovery, how refugees might try to make meaning of what happened to them and their hopes for the future. We should make efforts to focus on to focus on aspects that make a person stands out as a unique rather than one of million who suffers. Those stories are more valuable for our audience. So it's very important to not only talk about, uh, let me say, um, um, the challenges, but also to talk about the opportunities um, um, for refugees, um, what they can do and how they can um, be uh, useful uh, and contribute um, to the society they are now living um, in. Um, it's also going and it's also important uh, to try to look for any successful um, um, a story um, about, um, and here we can talk a lot about um, researchers, uh, scientists, uh, scholars, uh, professors um, uh, who are refugee, but they, they could um, find their path uh, in the hosting communities and uh, they do, are doing something uh, really uh, different and useful. Um, this is something um, I all the time remind myself uh, with. Scholars of immigration journalism have argued that it's hard to cover Iceland because it's a story that oozes rather than breaks. So the breaking news of smuggling ship sinking is easier to do than the massive sociopolitical, demographic and economic challenges of the entire phenomenon. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I hope I'm, um, uh, I was briefed enough and I welcome any question. Thanks a lot, uh, Mrs. Russia, for this uh, nice talk, but very fast as well. Thanks for your tips, basic tips, as accurate words, uh, respect dignity, ensure balanced coverage. I hope it will open uh, more discussions at the end. We will leave discussions at the end.
The next speaker will uh, be Mrs. Busaina Osama. Mrs. Busaina Osama is a science editor working as the regional coordinator of SciDev Net for the Middle East, North Africa, and the managing editor of the Arabic edition. She is a founding member of the Arab Science Journalists Association, also a trainer and a mentor for science uh, journalism skills and a speaker in many science and development related conferences. She is a co-author of Practical Guide for the Arab Science Journalists book. Uh, her lecture today will be about communicating science important skills for researchers. The floor is yours, Mrs. Busaina, for 15 minutes. Please, uh, Mrs. Russia. Thank you, stop Dr. Sharing Amal. Your... Yeah, thanks. Yeah, she stopped it, yes. Thank you yeah. very much, Make Dr. Amal. Uh, it's a pleasure. Make it full screen, full screen. Uh, from, my, from my end, you mean? Yeah. Make it full screen. I, I didn't share my my um, my presentation yet. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, thank you very much for uh, inviting me to this uh, very interesting uh, conference. And um, thanks to my colleagues, I want to pick some of what they already talked about from uh, Narina. I think. Uh, she mentioned a very important issue. It's about uh, science literate and how it's important to uh, build on in the community. Also, I think, as uh, David said, that uh, press officers in uh, science institutions is very important. But the problem that in our region, uh, the Arab region, I mean, is um, problematic, uh, particularly because uh, at some point we have press officers but they don't uh, really qualified or uh, do particularly their their role um, and in other cases there are no press officers at all uh, also we are uh, in a very lack of uh, um, courses that train uh, scientists in uh, science communication so particularly in the region there are only a master degree in science communication uh, in algeria uh, and that's all so uh, we our researchers are always missing the skills of communicating their science and uh, afterwards they are um, a kind of um, uh, feeling weird of communicating media, which always make this, um, as I said, as I say, that uh, it's like a, an ice wall between scientists and media. So actually, uh, let me share my screen now. Can you, can you see my screen? Not yet. Hello? Not yet, not yet. Did it appear? Not yet. Okay. Let me click again on sharing screen. Is it appearing now? Yeah, okay, okay. Perfect. Sorry. Um, um, I'm not sure how to make it full screen. Let me Make it full screen first before sharing. You will find it up. Um, 
Yes. Um, actually, le let me ask this question. Whom, whom to blame for lack of awareness around science issues? Um, is it journalists who are, as I said, uh, facing uh, hard times to communicate scientists and um, find uh, the right words to uh, simplify science and communicate it to the public, uh, or it's researchers who are, as I said, not familiar with dealing with media and uh, particularly in our region don't possess science communication skills that can help in delivering uh, science jargons to both journalists and policymakers. Um, why is it necessary to simplify science by the first way? Um, actually, I think David uh, um, covered this and uh, said how, how it's important for the researcher himself to communicate his science. It could uh, be important to uh, get him some funds, get him some relations, some networking. Um, even it's important to the uh, funders of his uh, research. Um, mostly in our region, for example, the, the, um, the governments are, are the basic funders for science research. So it's important for people to know more about uh, how, what their money is spent in. Um, so um, my organi organization, Side of Net, actually um, completing 20 years of experience uh, this year, and we have a, a very long experience in communicating science, particularly in the developing world. Um, we are covering uh, mostly the South, the global South, as we call it. Um, so uh, in, in five years from now, um, I mean, um, before five years from now, we started thinking of how important it's, it is to uh, give more uh, trainings in uh, communicating science uh, skills for uh, researchers and scientists. Um, and also to gather with them journalists who are starting a career in science journalism. So we uh, initiated a project called Script, and it's funded by Ro uh, report, uh, sorry, Robert Bush uh, uh, Foundation. Um, in this uh, particular project, we are putting some uh, useful resources for both uh, scientists and, and uh, um, journalists and communicators um, to uh, help them uh, possess more skills in, in communicating science. Uh, there is practical guides that uh, have uh, some uh, hints and tips for uh, researchers how to communicate their science well, also, we have a more important resource, which is a, a free um, course uh, that, sci uh, that scientists and researchers could, could enroll uh, at any time they want. Um, and even they can choose the module that they want to uh, carry on and find more about. Um, I encourage actually uh, researchers in our region particularly um, to get some of these modules because um, they can build some capacity in, in this uh, kind of skills which are um, really finding, pro finding a problem to possess in our region. Um, the free online uh, course, uh, as I said, uh, help the participants to understand how media works and also uh, assess them to be able to communicate their research outputs and work effectively with media. Um, as I said, some of our uh, research institutions are lacking press, press officers, for example. So we have some modules that help um, the scientists and researchers themselves to write a press release um, or do a, um, a press conference, how to talk in a press conference, uh, how to communicate easily your and simplify your science jargon. Um, also, um, there are um, some, some modules about how to speak uh, live on air in uh, some programs, radio or TV shows. Um, so I think this kind of, of skills are very useful uh, and uh, easy to know more about through this free course. Um, the next step, um, actually um, practicing 
science communication is uh, very important. So after uh, possessing the skills, you need to practice more. Um, I think um, many gathers like the one we are we are holding now is uh, very important to um, to actually fill the gap between journalists and researchers to make them more understandable to each other work and how it it works um so i think uh, finding this kind of of gathers or or uh, even training uh, that we already did inside of net we collected researchers and journalists together in the same place and trained them on science communication so it was a wonderful idea and i think it's uh, it it worth to uh, work with it further and try to find uh, similar trainings that collect researchers and and um, uh, science uh, researchers scientists and journalists in the same place maybe in the future it could be also policy makers at the same uh, place with both journalists and and uh, researchers to complete the triangle of um, the process of delivering uh, evidence-based decision, I think. Um, so um, also another way to possess this kind of skills is um, events, as I said, uh, like um, the one that we uh, almost finished um, days ago, it was the Arab um, the Arab Forum for uh, uh, Media and uh, Communication of Science. Um, I think this kind of, of uh, events is very important in uh, gathering, as I said, researchers and um, journalists in the same place to um, just ease and, and uh, relieve this kind of ice wall between, um, between researchers and uh, journalists. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Uh, I'm happy to know about your uh, training for scientists on science communication. We will discuss that at the end. Thanks a lot. Thank you. We will transfer to the next speaker, uh, Mr. Mohammed El Sumbati Ramadan. Uh, Mr. Mohammed Sumbati uh, is an award winning science journalist and the science communication consultant and trainer with nine years of experience. He has published more than six. 150 pieces about scientific topics. Too much <laughs> reputable outlets, including Scientific American, uh, SciDevNet, and Popular Science. He has provided consultancy uh, for many international organizations as Bridge Council uh, 1001 uh, in, uh, Inventions and the American University in Cairo, where he developed and delivered various science communication projects and events. He has delivered training sessions and workshops workshops for researchers and scientists to develop science communication skills in Egypt, Qatar, and Germany. Uh, his lecture will be about effective and successful science communication, top tips and best practices. The floor is yours, uh, Mr. Mohammed, for 15 minutes. So thank you, uh, Dr. Amal, for your uh, introduction and thanks all to the panelists for their wonderful lectures. Uh, good morning or afternoon or good evening, depends on your time zone. So uh, let me uh, share my screen with you to start immediately. But how you published 650 pieces in that age? It's American. Yeah, it's a journalistic basis. So yeah, I mean, you can work on one every week or something. Like it's not like a research. Of course, I would say to publish research, it's 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 okay. more difficult anyway. <laughs> so um, following on on what uh, Buthaina and David specifically like explored about science communication for scientists and researchers and the importance of that. I'm going to speak with you today about how we can communicate science effectively and successfully as uh, researchers or scientists, because it's already very important as, uh, as we all know. So I would like to share with you my, like, my quote, it's not my quote, I mean the quote, it's my favorite quote, it's science is not finished until it is communicated. It's a quote by Sir Mark Walbert, the former chief scientific advisor for the UK government. 
which emphasize the importance of uh, science communication. Science needs to go beyond the lab. Stories of scientists and their research outputs should be shared with everyone, not inside the scientific community through publications and conferences that is mainly by scientists and for scientists. We need to go beyond that sphere. So, but how can scientists and journalists do that? Actually, it's not that easy, but also it's not that hard. So I'm going to share with you today the best practices and top tips on how to communicate science. Generally speaking, science communication can be defined as communicating scientific knowledge in a plain language to a lay person or non-specialist audiences. So we are trying to tell people about science in a language that they can understand. And to do this, you need first to know who is exactly the non-specialist audience or that lay person. Actually, every one of us is a non-specialist in somehow, even scientists and researchers. They are specialized in one field, but they have no idea about other fields. So all of us actually are a target audience for many of science communication activities. So if you want to communicate your research or science, what should you do exactly? First, you need to ask yourself three basic questions. First, what I want to say exactly? What is the content I would like to share with others? The second question is, who are the audience I'm going to share this scientific or science knowledge or science with? And the third, how I'm going to do that? So what, who, and why? To do this, you need to do three things where I call them like the principles of effective science communication. Crafting a clear message of what you are going to say exactly. Secondly, knowing your audience, understand them very clearly. And third, to do a great presentation where you can present and deliver the scientific knowledge you are going to, um, to present or to tell the people. How to do that exactly? So I would like to share some top tips with you on how you can do this. First, for crafting a clear message. As a scientist or researcher, you have a massive knowledge. You are an expert in your very specific scientific field. You know a lot. And usually when it comes to think about what are you going to say exactly to the others, what do you want to tell? You have a lot of information and you want to tell people all the wonderful things that you are doing and share with them the wonderful or the scientific discoveries you have made. But not all the details need to be told to everybody. First things first, you need to summarize. You need to keep it short and simple. Just pick up the most important information of what you know or what you want to tell people about. After making this summarization of the content you would like or your message, you try to prioritize it. Choose what is the most important to tell and what is the least important to tell. And according to that prioritization, just pick up the first top things you want to tell people about and provide some little inf extra information about it because this is what is important. This is what's matter. You need just to tell people some extra information because some of your audience may be interested to know a little bit more, but not everything you know because it's difficult to do. But this is not the job of science communication. We are not making experts. We're just informing people or telling them about the science and why it's important and what we are doing as a scientist and researchers exactly. After you do these three steps of summarization, prioritization, and illustration, then you can encapsulate all of this into a clear, well-defined, and very concise message. This is the content you would like, you will share with your audience. Then we need to come to the second principle of effective and science communication, which is knowing your audience. You need mainly to know who are your audience, who are them, what are their age, what are their background. You need to know all of that because the way that you are telling your message or content to a child, it will be different from someone who is like uh, at the 30s or 40s and will be of course different from a retired person according to your audience this is or knowing your audience this is the way that you are going to um, framing your matches so you need to know who are your audience 
what are their backgrounds, what they know and don't know about the topic that you are speaking about. And also you need to ask yourself a very important question about why they are here, why these audience are interested to listen to you. What are their motivation? Search for this motivation because this will help you to targeting your audience and framing your message according to them. You know how you know already what you want to say, and you know who are your audience. You need to adjust your message and the content to this audience so that it can fit them. You try to speak their own languages, try to go to places where they are already there. So social media or like broadcasting media or whatever places they are in, try to go for them and target them. And finally, and try to engage your audience. This is very, very important because people have impressions that science is difficult or not that important, or it's very complex. So you need to find a way to engage them. So you need to find a hook that you can engage this audience. Start your uh, talk or your article or whatever you are doing to communicate science by trying to make a bang, something strange, something weird that makes people get interested in what you are saying. Either a, a weird question telling them about the application of something that you are doing in your research lab that it's connected to their daily life. Tell them a story, tell them a metaphor or analogy. All of this helps to hook your, at your audience and engaging them. And also you need to keep this attention through your presentation or your delivery because usually people start to lose attention after you start to talk and tell them about science you need to find a way to use that use a very clear language try to avoid any complex jargon or scientific term try to speak a plain language and uh, at the, the language that's used in their daily life try to use aids for example or anything that can help you from like small models or props to uh, to tell your story, sorry, to, to uh, clarify your idea, or if you are writing an article, try to put uh, illustrations or photos, all of these helping to keep the attention of your audience. So now you have your message, you know what you want to say, and you know your audience, for whom are you going to say that and fit your message according to that. Then it comes to the great presentation or the third principle of our um the of effective science communication so you need actually to think about two things in this uh great presentation first you need to think about the medium that you are going to use to communicate your science or research there are a lot of mediums are you going through tv or radio are you going through uh through a journalist in a journal or an online website are you are going to use social media are you going to be in a science festival for example or even giving a public talk for public audience about your research, you need to consider that, to think about this medium. Every medium of these have pros and cons. You need to think also about that. And you need to think about your own pros and cons. Maybe you are very confident to write, but you are not so confident to speak. So in that case, you should prefer to go through writing format rather than just speaking in front of people. And maybe like social media is not your thing. So you are trying to avoid that. So it mainly depends also on um, your, uh, your strength points, try to use it that much. And also it's about your audience, where your audience usually hang about. If you are addressing like, for example, teenagers, definitely they will be in the social media. Uh, try to, to reaching them through a, a journal, for example, it will not be the right way. After you think about the medium clearly, then you put your presentation or uh, your the, the ways that you are going to deliver this scientific knowledge into a structure. The very easy way to do it is just put it as beginning, middle, and end. Start in the beginning with the most important information that you already make it as your top priority when you are going when we, you were preparing your message. And then at the middle, start to give people some extra content or some background information. But in the same time, you have to make sure that you are keeping your attention. You are not losing them. Try 
not to give a lot of details that maybe not all of them want to know that or interested to know it. Try to avoid the scientific jargon and be clear. And then at the end, you need to re-emphasize the main or the top message you are, have already identified because usually the audience starts the beginnings and the endings. So you have to keep this in, to, in your mind when you are doing your presentation through whatever medium you are going to use. So this is, I would say, in a nutshell, how to communicate science um, uh, effectively and successfully. And I believe this can work for uh, many of scientists and researchers if who are interested in communicating uh, their science. So usually I use uh, this tool in order to help me in communicating science and research. And I call it like a book guide for to science communication because it can be printed and fitted in just one A4 page. And just, I put it in front of me whenever I think about how I'm going to communicate science. Actually, you can download a copy of uh, this using this uh, QR code or the link bit.ly slash SICOM WISWB for Women in Science Without Borders. Also, I will share this link with you in the chat box so everyone can have access to this uh, guide, which I believe can be helpful for many researchers and uh, scientists. So um, I think this is uh, all what I wanted to share with you today. Uh, also, maybe if you have any questions, it will be uh, discussed during the Q&A session and sharing more top tips with you. Feel free to contact me at uh, any time through my email or uh, website or Twitter, whatever you prefer. And uh, thank you so much for having me today. Thanks a lot, uh, Mr. Muhammad, for your top tips. Uh, and I like your quote as well. Science is not finished until it's communicated right. OK, now I will leave the floor to Dr. David uh, to begin discussions and questions. Thank you, Amal. That's, um, and thank you, Mohammed, and to all our speakers. It was a um, fascinating um, um, session um, and we have predictably had some very good questions in. Um, so the first one I, um, I wanted to uh, highlight was from Alabisi who asks, how can scientists overcome fear or panic due to being shy? Um, and I wonder whether, Rasha, you might want to address that question. You know, what do you do if you, you know, if you're a little bit introverted or a little bit intimidated um, by speaking in front of an audience or to a journalist? What's your advice there? You're muted. All of you should answer this question. Uh, all of you. Because it's the same advice when we have good conference or big conference and in front of journalists and so on. It's our problem always as a scientist. Would you like to go first, Russia? Sorry, that's what I meant. I wasn't sort of singling you out. <laughs> Excuse me, David, if you can briefly repeat your question because I have a problem in hearing you at the beginning. Yes, it was um, the question was around communicating um, to an audience if you're shy, you know, if there's a if you know, if you find doing that intimidating. Uh, actually, first of all, I, I always try to be very direct about the message I'm going um, um, to have through my article. So I all the time present myself very clearly. I present um, the name of the organization I'm working at, um, explain a bit why uh, I'm writing this and what my purpose as a journalist of it. And also I try to explain, uh, let me say, um, how much uh, uh, the article I'm going to write about could be uh, helpful in explaining the situation, the needs, the challenges, whatever, uh, but without making any kind of promises uh, about uh, that this is going to make a real change on the ground. So I just try to make sure that according to my rule as a journalist, I'm going to explain, I need to explain to the audience, to my audience, uh, what the challenges, what the issue, uh, all of this um, stuff. And also I try to, to give um, um, a kind of, let me say, a space to them to, to, to speak um, uh, and express uh, themselves uh, uh, freely without um, um, being hesitate um, uh, and give them time to, to think about what they want to, to talk uh, about or not. This is something for me, uh, very basic. Great, okay, Rasha, thank you very much. Um, 
Mrs. Osama next. Maybe I don't know if this comes up on the course on the script courses that you do, where people talk about, you know, shyness and feeling intimidated. Sorry, are you asking me? Yes, sorry, or yes, I was. Else? Yes, yes, it was you, yeah. Yeah. Um, my name is Botaina. <laughs> sorry. Oh, right. Sorry, I called you uh, Mrs. Osama, but it's, I was, yes, I was using your uh, your your title. Yeah. Uh, you, my last name, yeah. Okay. Yes. Um, actually, um, always there are this kind of, of uh, panic due to uh, meeting any uh, audiences. And this happened not only for scientists. It's, I, I think, more human uh, that people are a bit scared of, of being presenting in front of others. So uh, I think uh, it's part of the scientist himself to uh, overcome this by time, by training. I mean, uh, time after time, he will be more effective in delivering his message without feeling this panic um, facing, facing journalists. But it's also uh, some kind of um, um, responsibility on the journalist himself uh, in a press conference or so to uh, give the scientist the opportunity to express himself freely, to uh, not to force um, him to speak about a particular issue he might be hesitating in, in expressing. Uh, and also, um, sometimes uh, if you are doing an interview or something, you have to respect the off-record speak because uh, sometimes the scientists are very, um, uh, very um, uh, conscious and, and uh, very... Um, Specifically in our region, I mean, there, there is this kind of fairness that what they will be quoted and how they will be quoted. So um, give your, your uh, scientist you are interviewing uh, some space to speak off record and respect this off record speaking. And, and then write down the uh, appropriate quote that he wanted to put on, um, uh, on record and make sure that they are clear enough so to uh, own the respect of the scientist. Whenever you come back to him uh, and he feel that uh, you are a trustworthy source and uh, um, a media representer who uh, respect what he say and say it clearly and, uh, and um, uh, accurately, then he will do speak to you one more time. So building this trustworthy um, uh, relationship between uh, scientists and journalists um, may, may overcome this panic or this shyness that they may feel. Thank you, Bethina. That was uh, great advice there. Um, I, I always think I, I agree with you. I think it's important for a journalist to to you know if they see somebody who is probably you know comes across as a little bit shy or introverted, just to to help them relax and to to be friendly and to be warm. Um, you know, I, I've sometimes been interviewed by journalists and I've been very nervous, and um, they've helped put me at my ease. But um, thank you for that, um, Mohammed Ramadan. Do you have any other insights here? You know, through your science communication work. So. I would say usually like this question is asked a lot by scientists and researchers that I fear I don't feel confident enough, something like that. So my answer is mm -hmm. be like practice, practice, practice. This is the only way that you can do it. You need to practice, give it a try. Don't be so judgmental or critical on yourself. Like the first time will not be perfect, but by time it is getting better. And also if you have, if you think that, um, if you are going to communicate your science, for example, in a public check lecture and you don't feel confident about that, just go uh, another way, try just to, to speak with a journalist who can be interested in your work and can write about it. So it, 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 you, you always have a lot of varieties and options just to go for what you feel confident about and give it a try and by time you try this and this. And thank you. Yeah, Mohammed. It works, That's it works fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, I'm just going to I'm going to turn to Narina now, but I would like to, um, you know, if you if you have any observations on the, that Narina, who was our first speaker. But another question I want to weave in because I feel it speaks to your topic is, um, you know, the communication to people that don't believe science, um, that actually people that, you know, just don't have confidence or faith in science and how any how you communicate to them. Has that sort of come across? You have, have you come across that in your work at all? I was, I was going to start with Narina for this one. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, so for regarding um, uh, somebody who's 
Guys, I will. Um, I agree with uh, all the suggestions that you have said. Um, uh, training, 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 and uh, um, I believe uh, one suggestion that you mentioned is about working first, working um, with uh, journalists that you trust. Uh, so it's uh, uh, and um, it is always the first step is the the, the most difficult one very often, and uh, it happens always when when I interview, for example, people, and then I share the interview. This is the first time it's really difficult to see yourself on a videos because nobody normally likes to see <laughs> yourself on the videos. And uh, uh, but but you you can get used to it if you uh, said um, you collaborate with people that you trust. And, uh, and the other uh, that uh, was already mentioned, but I would try to underline is really to make clear your message. Because if you are uh, um, um, sure about what you want to say and start with uh, short steps, then um, I think that you can overcome uh, your shyness. And this is also related to your second question, how to communicate with uh, people who do not believe in science. And uh, the, the first, uh, um, uh, idea that uh, normally we get uh, is to try to come and show them uh, that uh, there are many, many data about the science, there are many examples uh, why it is. Uh, but uh, normally the best way to do is, is that, uh, as uh, I mentioned at the beginning, where do uh, magic happen? Uh, and it happens very often when you, um, it is not magic, but that you get to know the people. Uh, so it is very often through the people, if you trust the people that are telling you what it is, at, the, um, at, the, at some point you are going to to get uh, through with the message and understand uh, um, then uh, that what they believe and start with them and uh, start with the with the, the question that they have and start uh, to to um, 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 asking them. So it, it was uh, the, uh, recently I, I was speaking with uh, somebody who works in communication in Italy and uh, he, he said that uh, when he trained um, young boys uh, who were um, uh, stealing um, um, stuff and he was there to, to train them to change uh, their attitude uh, for an organization, he, um, he asked them to teach him how to steal at the very oh. beginning. And, <laughs> the, and then in that way, they, 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 they became the teachers and at that point he, he, he found a way to reach them. And uh, I, I like the story very much. Very clever. Yeah, thank you very much for that. Um, I'm just move, going to move on to Rasha now. Do you, are you I wonder if you've got any experiences of talking to people who don't believe or trust science, how you win them over? Any thoughts there? Uh, actually, sometimes I meet people who, uh, does, who don't um, believe in journalism and um, if it's <laughs> Uh, good for them in any way, especially because um, I'm talking about refugees because they suffer a lot from stereotype and um, uh, let me say um, bad images um, um, uh, about themselves uh, on media. So they all the time feel that this, this is in vain. We are not going to gain anything out of this. Uh, um, uh, on the contrary, it's going to harm us more. So um, again, I just uh, try to be very simple and very direct about the message I'm going to have out of this. Uh, I try to show good examples um, of um, uh, how, um, uh, like, good articles, let me say, or um, um, kind of good science, how helped uh, and affected uh, people's life uh, in a good way. And also, again, I give them some time to think. I, I don't. I, mean, I try not to be um, uh, too much pushy and pushy in this. I just want them to to uh, reconsider things in a different way, in a different approach. And sometimes I try to go and talk with some other people who might know them and might help me in convincing them by offering good examples. I all the time feel that showing good examples could be very helpful. Great. Thank you very much. Um, I have and a Bethina, question for you, David, if I might. Yes. Oh, yes. Go, go for it. Yeah. <laughs> this is something for me as a journalist, because in your presentation, you talked about that usually as a journalist, we don't um, share final version of the article um, uh, with the people we interview, with the scientists to review or to check. So, um, and I'm, I'm sure you know that many times people got angry of this and they make yeah. it a condition. I'm not yeah. going to talk with you um, without being able to review and check. So what do you do in this case? 
Oh, it's a very good question. <laughs> um, well, I try and I try and um, win them over, and I try and explain to them that actually, you know, we cannot extend this to everybody. You know, if I'm interviewing ten people for a story, you know, giving ten people the right to review their quotes and to, you know, sometimes they want to see the whole thing, so they want to see how their mm -hmm. bit sits in there. So I try and I can compromise. You know, sometimes I will say. I will read back your quotes to you. Or the other thing I do is at Nature, we take the fact checking process, like many other titles, all other titles actually, I suppose, very seriously. So I will go back to the source and say, you know, I just want to check that, um, you know, you're, you know, you worked from eight o'clock in the morning to eight o'clock in the evening, you study this. And it's, um, it's a way of sort of, I would say, you know, not sharing, not sharing the information, sharing the information with them, but not the actual text. Um, so, but but if they do, if they if they if it becomes a non-negotiable, I have to think how important is this source to me, and if um, and if it isn't that important, I'll think well, actually, you know, you've lost an opportunity here to be included, and um, you know, I'm really sorry about that, but you know, we can't, bre you know, we can't break our policy here. That's that's what I do, and uh, but I am, I mean, you know, we we I'd love to hear what you do actually, because I, I I'd love this question. It's such a great one, but we can maybe we can. I've just been, I've just uh, reached out to you on LinkedIn, so uh, maybe we can continue this offline. But um, yeah, thank you for asking that. Um, I was going to move on now to Bethina, just with the with the anti science people. I don't know whether script has um. A module about how you do talk to people that just don't believe in science, or indeed, as um, as as Russia said, don't believe in journalism. It's the same thing, yeah. So, how do you convince the uh, people, Bethina, to have more confidence in science? Actually, there's a practical guide that you oh, can rely on. Some tips, yeah, about how to communicate science to people who are against. Um, uh, science ideas, uh, particularly in, in the Arab region, there are famous ideas that we face from uh, like uh, that the earth is uh, flat or um, uh, uh, how you are ex explaining the Darwinism and you are adopting it and it's it's against religion or something like this. So this kind of ideas we always face in, in our region particularly. And um, Sometimes you have to use basic science to convince these people. Sometimes it's um, not worthy. <laughs> yes, um, I agree. A, a struggle to convince them. <laughs> yeah. 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 You, are, you, you will be consuming time because they, they, sometimes you can find out that they, they will not change their, uh, their thoughts. So um, yeah. you have to decide if it's it worth going through this battle or you um could just leave it there yes yeah i'm just um that's a that's a great great response i'm just um you just have to give up sometimes don't you i'm just uh sharing in the chat box um, exactly um <laughs> Uh, just a link to an article we published in Nature Careers a couple of days ago from um, a black scientist who, you know, for very understandable reasons, her family have sus deep suspicions of the of the COVID vaccine, and um, she's just talking about how she, you know, how she, how she sort of explained it to them. So I don't know if people would find that useful. But um, Mohammed, I'm just turning to you now. Have you uh, have you got any stories to share on? communicating with people that um, are anti-science um, and actually once you've addressed that I want to turn to another question that got asked about um, any good science communication courses to recommend I see that you went to Edinburgh uh, but you must have looked at some other ones and I think um, Athena mentioned one in Algeria but I don't know if you've got any other ideas about where you can study science communication but let's go for the anti-science question first Okay, so for, for the anti-science questions, I want to stress on, on two main points. The first one is communicating science is not just communicating scientific facts. Big part of it is about communicating how science works. Because usually a lot of people who don't believe in science, they don't understand the mechanisms of how science works, the scientific methodology, or that the idea is that science is trying to correct itself and criticizing itself very heavily all the time. So you need sometimes, I think, to, to elaborate how we are going to, how we have these facts or these findings helps to, to uh, fighting this. The other point is when you are, when scientists and researchers are dealing with audience who are, don't believe in science, actually, this is one of the times that scientists and the researchers need to listen more than speak. They need to listen and understand where these ideas that the, these audience have, they need to figure out why. And then the, if they understand that it may help them 
to uh, to communicate their these scientific uh, facts and findings. Uh, for your second question concerning uh, the courses, uh, I would recommend a website called SciComp Finder. I will share the link later in the chat box. Actually, it's a mm. kind of a list of all courses and academic modules, degrees in science communication and public engagement with science. Um, so I think it will be very helpful. Uh, according to my knowledge for, for Africa, for uh, academic modules, the one that uh, I have recommended in Algeria, it's for science journalism, but it actually it is in French, not in Arabic, not in English, it's, it's, it's delivered in French. And there is another course uh, coming from South Africa from the University of Stellenbosch. I, hopefully I can say it right. Yes. Um, yeah, they provide already, uh, I think, a kind of postgraduate diploma uh, online and also i think they have a, a recently they introduced a master program in uh, in science communication also so as far as i know this is the only academic degree that's there in uh, in africa but in europe us uk specifically you have a lot so i will share with you the site confinders so that you can uh, know more ideas about what what is there around Thank you very much, Mohammed. Um, I'll return I, to Noreen now. Can I add for, something, oh, David? Yes, please Sorry. do. Yes, um, yes. Can just yeah. Um, actually, I shared in the chat box uh, a link of uh, some universities that deliver uh, science communication courses in Africa because someone asked about them. So um, it might be right. useful to have a look at them. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So yes, do look in the chat because um, Mohammed is going to add his link and um, Bethina's added hers. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I, I know of some, but I think uh, they'll be on the list that you you're both going to supply here. Um, so yes, I was going to return to Narina now because I've got one question came up from um, uh, Professor uh, Rosemary around um, the you know the different styles or you know the best medium to communicate to politicians, funders, communities, colleagues. Can the same medium be used for all stakeholders? This is from Professor Tonjok Rosemary Kinja from the University of Bamenda in Cameroon. And um, I mean, you know, my take for what it's worth is that you can use the same um, you can use the same medium, and you know, people do read similar things, but there must be arguments to tailor and to target. Uh, Narina, I don't know if you have any thoughts on this. Uh, I completely agree with you. Um, at this side, though, there are different. Uh, as we, I think, um, all said that you, you really think to uh, ask uh, who is your audience, how is your, what is the message, and uh, um, of course you, there are, there are completely different uh, audiences and with different purpose. If you want to speak with uh, um, policymakers, of course, probably because you have some suggestion regarding policies, and this is another kind, I'm making only an example, it's another mm -hmm. kind of approach that you need to use. Uh, for for the public, and uh, if but uh, uh, to review what I answered, you cannot use the same uh, message. But if you have, for example, already spoken with the the, the policymakers and you have a, a a campaign that you want to sensibilize about something, for example, uh, social science uh, something, that in that case you could have um, a strategy that covers similar uh, messages uh, on similar. Uh, on, on the, using the same medium uh, for the uh, for everybody. As what I'm saying is that if you have an infographic on Twitter, it can reach everybody that you think to reach. But starting from the very beginning, I would definitely say no. You need a different medium with different messages, and it doesn't mean that uh, everybody can um, engage with an infographic, for example. I hope okay. that I it was. Uh, clear yes. enough. <laughs> yeah, no, fantastic. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, sort of a, 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 a two state, a, a dual track thing, really, you know, think about the mass medium, you know, the social media that gets read by lots of people and then, you know, tailor it if you if something that funders are more likely to go to go for that. Yeah. So I like it. Thank you very much. Um, Rasha, any thoughts about about this, about sort of tailoring messages to different audiences um, beyond what Narina said? Uh, I totally agree with what, uh, with what uh, Narina uh, said and um, based on my experience covering education and research in the Arab region, I all the time feel that um, uh, we, we, we are writing about a specific topic, but as a journalist, we are writing about a specific topic to all audience, not to specific audience. I, I all the time feel that um, when we are talking about uh, special kind um, uh, or um, a specific topic, 
this shouldn't mean that I'm going to talk to a specific audience. As a journalist all the time, my writing should be very direct, very simple, uh, that can uh, attract all readers because uh, we want everyone to be interested in science. We want everyone to care about refugees crisis, for example. So I'm not, so this is something uh, very important. And also all the time, I feel that I need to make sure that I'm including accurate information uh, and make a double fact checking for any numbers, uh, figures I'm going to use because um, um, I know how much number is important. Um, uh, but at the same time, it's not the whole story should be numbers. Sometimes people feel that when you have a lot of details, a lot of numbers, a lot of figures, they got may they may get lost. They may lose interest to read the whole um, article. So all the time, I try. I, I'm I'm doing my best to select. Let me say the basic, most important numbers, figures, uh, evidence I have. Uh, and make a kind because I'm working with online um, uh, journalism. So make sure that I have enough links for people who want to to read further, but not to put all, uh, let me say, the details, uh, the um, information, uh, uh, not um, the numbers uh, in one place. So it's just to make sure my my uh, my article or my message is clear um, and clean, uh, direct and simple. So right. it's nice. all for everyone. Thank you, Rasha. No, I, yeah, that's that's a fantastic point. And you know, as you were talking there, I was I was thinking of a, a question that Dr. Shaheen Abul Karim has asked about. Um, you know, if you make something, if you if you make a fear about making a mistake, if you say something stupid, as she says, or get something wrong, I mean, you know, my advice there is, you know, of course, you know, it's always nice to get things right. But if you do get things wrong, people are only human, and you know, the the beauty of digital media is it can not be wrong for long you know you can correct things so um you know if you feel like you said something that's incorrect i would say contact the journalist and just point it out that you you double check something afterwards and um you know any chance for that to be corrected um and i'm sure you know most uh, most outlets would be fine with that um bathina do you have any thoughts um beyond what um Rasha and narina have said about tailoring the message to a different audience beyond what we've already discussed um, actually, not much to add, but uh, it, I, I, I assume that it's very, very, very important to um, decide who are the audiences you are talking to. And according to this, you can tailor your uh, content that you will be uh, delivering. So uh, this is particularly a very important um, point, both for researchers and for journalists when they are talking. Um, I think I I, I, um, I have some tips for for um, simplifying science as as uh, Russia mentioned. For example, to uh, put examples, more examples can be easier um, to explain. Uh, also, to um, uh, sometimes um, uh, putting. Uh, um, a nearer example, for example, if you are explaining uh, some space, you can say it's it's almost like a, a football game uh, uh, court. Or if you are uh, um, talking about uh, food or something, you can you can uh, explain how how they can be catched in a fork or something. So um, putting this kind of of symbol ways to this to explain things um, may be proper with with particularly general um, uh, public uh, for scientists to explain their science. Great. No, thank you. Um, Mohammed, I feel like you touched on this, didn't you, in your presentation when you talked about your audience, um, you know, as one of your sort of uh, three pillars of um, working it out. But anything else to add here? Yeah, I, I think usually for some audiences that can be I would say harder than the others, for example, policy makers. It's very important for the person who are going to communicate science to understand their needs and their needs and their motivation. What do they want to hear and why actually you should, should be interested? So you should put yourself in their shoes in, in, in another way. Uh, for example, for, for, for the policy makers specifically, they just need facts, evidence in order to make policy or take decisions. So you need to be very, very, very concise. They are not interested in all of these de details. Usually when they are listening to a scientist, they realize that he or she is an expert. So they just know his feedback on this, his, op his opinion that is evidence-based, what he would recommend. So just 
be very concise. In, in that case, try to uh, provide some supporting evidence, but not much details as policymakers usually, they are very, I would, I would not say like very busy, but usually they don't give much time to listen to the others. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Um, again, you know, I, I'm just thinking about my own career section at Nature. You know, we, we our audience is really early career researchers. You know, we feel that if we get it right for early career researchers, we're doing our job. But we we think about the halo effect as well. So we know that this audience is hugely important to funders and to others. So you know, we we're not just read by early career researchers, but we if we if we get it right for them, then we feel we've got it right for other people too. But um, yeah, there is definitely definitely some tailoring of messages to be done there. So um, Amal, I, I've completely lost track of time because I've been having so much, um, enjoying this session so much. I don't know whether we, um, have we run out of time? Are you going to tell us off or do we have more time? I have, yes, we have more time. We have 10 minutes left. Okay, right. Um, but I have not, I have not, it's not always the fault of uh, scientists. Sometimes the journalists run after uh, the social media and trends, really. Uh, several subjects now after trends it's yes. not really facts or uh, and after the big names uh, yes. sometimes as example on uh, the women day similar names on all media you understand uh, on the day of refugees similar names on every uh, journal uh, journals you understand it's a trend yeah yes that's true um, and yes, it's not you know, good. That, I think it's um, yeah, you may you make uh, bad followers because the right. people think that uh, if you are nature or science or uh, famous magazine or something like that, so that you are the source of science and all other things not so uh, not science. Right. So that you have div uh, to diversify uh, uh, the sources as nature uh, made recently, really. I noticed several uh, publications about people from US and people from uh, Asia, from Africa, from Arab region. Now uh, nature is fine with uh, careers and so on. But uh, before that, I rarely found uh, any uh, uh, article about uh, success story from Arab region, as example, except yes. one or two. Yes, yeah, no, that's a very fair point. And, um, you know, I. I, I I mean, you know, I don't want to kind of talk about my own section here, but, you know, we again, we judge the success of a piece if it have as many perspectives as possible. And, you know, you're absolutely right. But, um, you know, but it, it, it kind of it's incumbent on the science community in in, you know, in Arab countries, Middle East and all over the world to just share their stories with us. So, you know, yes, social media is a very good way of spotting trends. And I would encourage scientists to embrace social media because, you know, everybody looks at it. But, um, yeah, I mean, but, you know, it's incumbent on journalists to, to you know, to to um to be to be balanced yeah, and you to have, you know find uh, you good have stories. responsibility to some extent to search yeah. for stories as example one yeah. conference one big conference international conference i found i uh, was attending uh, i was attending this conference i found all speakers from london college i asked right. it, the organizers why is it conditioned to be uh, a recipient from award from a london college or graduate from London yeah. College to be a speaker in this conference. It's bad, really. Now we, we have to diversify the, the experiences because really other parts of the world are very rich in experience. Absolutely, absolutely, yes. Um, now, think in this, if I may. Yes, of course, Russia, yes, please do. Dr. Amal, I totally agree with you that uh, unfortunately now it's much easier to follow the trend than to look into uh, and dig uh, for something new and make the fact checking. But again, as a journalist, I also would like to take the opportunity um, of this session and of the forum because I know how, um, there are many uh, scientists and researchers are attending uh, it. I would like also to, to say something related about the relation between journalists and scientists. It's not the relation one direction from journalist to scientist. It also should be in two in two ways, let me say, in two directions. So I all, also, as a journalist, I expect and I really feel um, very happy to receive, um, let me say, calls from scientists themselves asking me, um, I want to explain something to me or want to reach uh, audience through me. So it's not only 
me as a journalist who um, have to make this communication, I also encourage and invite all the scientists, researchers to also take the step and also to communicate with journalists. Even the journalist is not now currently working on something. You as a scientist, as a, uh, as a researcher, send email to explain something trendy nowadays, um, to explain your point of view, to, um, to ask um, for, um, for more talk about something. So help us in, um, in explaining uh, issues. M maybe um, we, um, like due to the, um, the workload and the flood of the news, we, we are not aware of. So um, take the, the step towards um, journalists again and try to explain to them and be in touch with them. I know uh, we, we mentioned very early the, the, the importance role of the, let me say, the PR officers um, uh, or the um, uh, communication officers. But again, as an ind individual, you don't need a press office um, um, uh, to, to, to introduce you to the, to the journalist. Once you feel that there is something you trust in uh, a publication, a journalist you follow, you read and you trust him or her, just give him a call or send email to explain something. That will be very helpful for us. Thank you, Rasha. Yes, That's I know fantastic. that uh, several, one comment, uh, several journalists are very good, uh, like David himself. He was very patient in reviewing my article and so on. But several journalists stop uh, replying on emails or ignoring emails sometimes, especially uh, in front of early career. That's the point. That's why we have to recommend that journalists also uh, should uh, make hand for uh, the scientists and the new career and so on. Thank you, Amal. I mean, I feel this, this, if we have got time for a final question, uh, Vani has asked something kind of related, I think. So, you know, the question there is, um, you know, if other stakeholders besides journalists are also involved, and, you know, we're talking about communications people, advertising, PR agencies. Um, I mean, my answer to that, for what it's worth, is that, of course, you know, you can we've talked about press offices and, you know, the luxury of having a press office for many institutions and, you know, as um you know, as um, as we've just heard, you know, you can reach out um, directly to journalists. So, you know, Rasha made that point. But of course, journalists also do talk to PR agencies. They do talk, you know, they 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 have all sorts of um, channels of information, uh, social media included. Um, so, you know, if you're if you're not talking direct to a journalist, journalists will be looking at the other things that uh, you've mentioned, Vanny, I would say. Um, so press releases, you know, advertising copy, PR agencies. Um, so, you know, I, I thought that was just something to to point out. Um, it, in the final six minutes, I'm, I mean, I'm, you know, if you could indulge me with a question, I, I'd, I'd like to return to this off the record thing because I felt we may have given out mixed messages here because I said very cynically that there is no such thing as off the record or you have to be very careful with off the record. Uh, Bethina, you said, I think, something slightly different. Um, you know, you feel that, you know, just if you want to clarify, you know, how you feel that um, scientists should treat off the record, I'd love to get your thoughts again. Um, actually, as I said, um, dealing with a, a society like ours uh, and um, um, what they call it, the restrictions on uh, expressing uh, opinions freely. Um, so uh, sometimes scientists want to speak freely, but to put this off record to give you the um, coincidence and uh, the circumstances that was around the, the finding itself. So particularly in regions like ours, you have to respect this off record speaking and let them speak freely and then uh, decided maybe together, um, what would you put on record and and uh, he will be happy to put on record. This is my, my um, experience actually with dealing right. with scientists, uh, particularly in, in, in regions like ours. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mohammed, do you, um, does that, does that um, chime with your perception too? Um, that, you know, journalists that, that, you know, off the record is a good, has its value and, um, you know, it's usually respected. I mean, it's a tricky question, actually. It, it depends, <laughs> really, because, like, some, um, like, as, as a journalist, when I'm working with a scientist as a source, for example, I need to build these kinds of uh, long-term relationship with 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 him or her. So, definitely, in our 
early contact there will be not that much of the record but with time it will develop but i think like my what i think as a moral obligation that uh, if he mentioned that something is off record, I, I will not mention him. And if I feel it's very important, I will try to persuade him or her that we can reframe this in some way that it, it, it provides your opinion, but not in a way that can be bad for you. Also, you, you have to consider that in some cases you are working, let's say, in non-democratic countries where mm. if a scientist expressed a certain opinion, it can have a catastrophic effect. So you need to, to, to make uh, the balance. Yeah. And, but, but I think morally, if you're going to say something that you know that it may cause a problem, you have to tell that clearly to your source. Of even that sensitive uh, topic, you need to, to be clear as a journalist about that with, with your sources. OK, thank uh, but you. Yes. Yeah. But yes. uh, Mohammed, if I may ask you, what if um, like it was on record and after you finish your interview or whatever, you get a call saying that please make this off record? Of course, or somebody else? Yeah, yeah. When you are like talking with a resource and he is he he or she knows uh, he is on record and he said if, whatever he want to say, but after you finish and go home or to your office, you receive a call saying please make what I have said uh, off call, not on uh, uh, on call. Um, actually, I would ask him or her first why and try to understand the reason. If it's not convincing, I would say no. If it, if he, he or she has an argument, I would go back to my editor, I'm a freelance, and, and, and make it as a discussion. It's not just like one way put this or move this. It, it have to be discussed. Maybe we can be re reframed or something. But I, if I feel that the argument is, is not enough, I would say, we were very clear that is, this is on record and you already said that. And I have a proof also if I'm, I have an email written by you or I, I have a record with you. So that's why you have always as a journalist to keep your records so that if it like escalated to uh, on, a, on a legal basis, you always have, okay, I have this record. It's in, it was on your, uh, you agreed to make this, you said this. So it's not my, yeah. Mm -hmm. Narina, any closing I, comments? I, I, also, I, I, yeah, so I, I, um, I develop my, uh, I develop, I develop my, my um, platform, Tracy Streams, and I interview researchers, and I do in a way that um, I couldn't do if I would work for a, uh, yeah, for a journal, I would say, yeah. because it, um, uh, we build up the, as we say, we do the, for example, the interviews um, uh, because we want to bring out a message. And uh, it is, uh, if it is off record, in my case, it's really off record. As I have, uh, you work in another situation, of course, and, yes. and um, but in, in, in my case, really, I work together with the people. And uh, if there is, uh, I, I know a lot of personal uh, things that I wouldn't, uh, of course, tell. And if I can uh, tell um, with Amal, Professor Amal, we have uh, spoken very often about the fact that uh, the journalists, they follow the trends, but we know that also the journalists um, are, are in the position that they need to look for the clicks, uh, the likes, and the, the, also this needs a big discussion, I think, to change it. And I think that there are many of us uh, working to create a more diverse um, uh, situation where we listen to voices from different uh, parts of the world and different uh, uh, situations, if, if I think. Thank you, Narina. Well, I think that's a fantastic way to close. Um, big conversations. We've had one for the last couple of hours. It's been fascinating. I hope it carries on. Um, Amal, you're going to turn us off, I think, aren't you? Because we've run out of time. But do you need to, I need yeah. to presumably pass back to you now, do I? We need to open all cameras to uh, take photo. Please <laughs> open all cameras oh, okay. to take photo. Instead right. of uh, personal uh, <laughs> meeting, we will uh, open cameras to take photo. <laughs> Dr. Okay. Ahmed, could you please uh, take photo for us? Yes, if you are ready. Okay, we are ready. Okay. Just a smile, please. All of the, all of you smile. <laughs> okay. I will take one, one more shot. All right, all done. Thank you so much.
Thank Thanks you. a lot, uh, all of you, for accepting my invitation for presenting you, such uh, good presentations. I really enjoyed. Thanks a lot. We will meet again. Uh, thanks for all attendees. We will meet uh, again uh, in a few minutes uh, in technical sessions. Bye. Bye-bye. 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 Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. You can join us Bye -bye. in technical sessions. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye.